Good morning. morning. Let's stand, let's sing together. morning whether you're joining us online or in person we welcome you all the same and at this time turn to your neighbor and say good morning
your way back to your seat, I'm going to ask that you continue to stand and worship with us. time we have this morning's announcements. Here are this morning's announcements. Our baby bottle boomerang will be available next Sunday, May 14th. Please plan to pick up a baby bottle and fill it with spare change. All donations go to support Heartbeats Women's Center. Reminder, there will be no service on DUMC campus on Sunday, May 28th. We will join in community with local churches at Rock Springs Campground that Sunday and worship together. Please mark your calendars. 
calling all youth. If you are a 2023 high school or college graduate and would like to attend our graduation service, please send your information to Ben Nobles by Friday, May 19th, so we can celebrate your accomplishments. We will celebrate all of our graduates during the 11 a.m. traditional service on Sunday, June 4th in the sanctuary. Also happening on Sunday, June 4th, is the return of our Arbor Outdoor Worship. This service will be a blended worship style at the Arbor every Sunday at 9 a.m. and will run throughout the summer months. half asleep over there till Aaron looked at me with that look like get up here uh, yeah welcome uh, all those online it's so good to have all of you here in this space today it's a great church and many times to get up here and tell you some of the things that we do um, mostly around missions so today I want to share something with you that's completely boring and mundane we put new lights in the old fellowship hall. Yay, aren't you happy? <laughs> and, and, and if you've ever done anything in there that you may be <laughs> fired up because we changed them over from the old, uh, old lights that just kind of blinked and halfway came on to LED lights. So now you can see in there. Um, and uh, suddenly everybody got better or not as good looking as they used to be over there. But I'm just telling you that because we do so much with outreach. We do so much to push the love of God out into our community, but we also do a lot to take care of the physical space God has blessed us with. And when you give back to God through this church, it's all part of the totality of ministry that we seek to offer in the name of Jesus. So I'd like to invite those who will be taking up this morning's offering to come up and pass these baskets. And this is an act of worship. It's a way that we give back to God from the abundance that God has given to us. And so very grateful for the ways in which this church supports all of our ministries and even helps keep the lights on. So God bless you all. We were waiting without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Heaven held it. 
its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who'd come to the father all restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel shall not faint by his blood and in his name in his freedom i am free for the love of jesus christ who has resurrected me Father, we just come to you just so thankful this morning. God, we thank you for this beautiful weather we've had, and, and we thank you for every good and wonderful thing, for we know it comes from you above. But God, we all know that each one of us is facing something this morning, whether it's a loved one or something coming up next week or in the future. God, we ask that you just go before each of these situations and just give us a sense of peace about every one of them. God, we know that you are a mighty and capable God, and we know that you are in control. Help us remember that. We're so eager to fix our own problems, and we just need to remember that we just need to call upon your holy name. Jesus. We ask that your Holy Spirit fill this place this morning as we are about to receive the word. God, we thank you. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
if you're if you're wondering if I just uh, stand up here during those and act like I'm doing something, that's exactly what's happening. Um, passing time till the video ends. Um, you won't have to watch that video too much longer. I do, although I do greatly appreciate Aaron putting that together. It's served as a great bumper video for this series that we've been in most of the spring. We are coming to at least a stopping point in our study of Matthew, uh, and we are about to wrap up the Sermon on the Mount, which is Jesus's primary and most pivotal teaching uh, of giving the church the direction we need for how to live out our lives faithfully following him. Um, but before we start today, I, I just want to lift up that yesterday was kind of a heavy day uh, for me personally. And, and then, of course, in this country, maybe you saw, I imagine you did, that there was yet another mass shooting in a mall in Texas. Um, eight people plus the gunman killed. And it, it seems like those stories just flood us all the time. We're almost becoming numb to the reality that that's our reality. And that, that's heavy. I don't know the answers. I, I wish I did. I just don't. Let's know that something's, our, our nation, our society, our culture's hurting and struggling. Also, yesterday morning, we had a, um, had a, a called annual conference to approve the disaffiliation of 192 churches from this annual conference. And maybe you've been following this closely. Some of you have, others have not. But the United Methodist Church is in the midst of a tough time trying to figure out what's next. And some churches have feel like they can no longer be a part of the United Methodist Church over uh, what may be changes in the future. Others are saying, well, no, I, I want to wait and see what those churches are. And others are saying, no, we're part of the United Methodist Church regardless. Those are all tough things. And when those churches disaffiliated and it was all done online, it 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 was hard for me personally because three of those churches in particular, Higgins Memorial and Burnsville, was the church that I joined when I became United Methodist. And then Mays Chapel in Maiden was my first appointment as a field ed student. And then Midway near Lexington was my second field ed appointment. And so having been in those churches and been a part of those churches for some, for briefly at least, it, it's just the separation, it, it's hard. And then several of the pastors who've dis, who also disaffiliated are close friends of mine, people I've known for over 25 years. And so when those things change, it, it brings a heaviness. Yeah, I don't have the answers for that either. What I do know is that this church is in a discernment time. We have a, a discernment team that's been appointed by the administrative board. And um, they have been doing some very difficult work, very difficult spiritual work of meeting and praying and talking and discussing. And they've met almost every week since oh, about February, and they've had some very difficult conversations. The administrative board on Monday night provided them with some further clarity, and the administrative board direct that, directed that group to get the church to a place where we can take an informed vote on this subject. And that means they'll be sending a notice to our district superintendent um, and having the district superintendent then set a date for that church conference. It's up to him when that church conference will be set, but you can probably uh, look sometime in the early fall for that to happen. At that, I Also, I want you to know that a big part of the spirit behind the administrative board's decision process in this is to enable everyone in this church to have a say. To um, it, it is to give you the opportunity to make the decision about the future of the church, and that's a lot of what's behind the spirit of going ahead and moving in that direction. You'll hear more as we go through the summer from this group. You'll get more information. You'll get this and that. Um, but just know that all those things, for me at least, were a pretty pretty heavy day. Uh, even in the midst of some really awesome things, you ever notice that you can have. 
have really awesome things and really hard things at the same time. Um, my wife Marcy and I celebrated 23 years of marriage yesterday. Uh, thank you, thank you. Okay. I'm glad I didn't say that was the really hard thing. This is being recorded. Um, I also got to go and officiate a wedding out at Vesuvius Vineyard for a, a young couple, um, the bride, a member of this church, uh, Dale Brumfield. And that was uh, Dale and Austin's funeral. It was beautiful. A funeral. Whew. I'm going to start there. <laughs> Anybody else? Where's David or Ben? Can you come up here? Uh, somebody call in the pit. Come up, somebody call in that relief pitcher already. Um, you may not know this, but in the United Methodist Book of Worship, they have the wedding services followed closely by the funeral services. You don't want to open the wrong page. But even in the midst of, of joy and hope, there's, there are things that are hard. And so would you just allow me to, to pray a psalm for us? The psalms are the, the prayer book of the Bible. They teach us how to pray. Psalm 130 is a psalm of lament. And before we move on to the message this morning, I'd like to pray this psalm of laments for regardless of what we may feel it is the best thing for the future of the church. Uh, I pray that we all lament that we're at this place and that we take that before God and allow it to rest with God and trust that God will be attentive. And so hear this prayer, which is Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be worshiped. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. In the Lord's word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with the Lord there is plenteous redemption. And the Lord will redeem Israel from all iniquities. Amen. Thank you for that time and be in prayer for your church, the leadership of your church, and just pray that God's will be done because we're not the first people to struggle. We're not the first people to have to figure things out. Um, God's seen the church through all kinds of things over 2,000 years, and God's going to see this congregation through this time as well. Now, I would ask you to uh, shift our attention a little bit to this teaching from Matthew, the seventh chapter, and I'm going to read verses 15 through 23. And as I read these verses, um, these are some of the more troubling verses in the Bible for me. Maybe they will be for you too. Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs, figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, and the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. And then Jesus goes on to say, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Oh, that's a hard one to say thanks be to God for. For I will say, depart from me, you evil doers. See why this pushes me? Why this text challenges me? Because Jesus knows that his earthly ministry will be brief. His 
time to physically lead the church. It's just a blimp on the radar. It will pass on to other people. It will pass on to his chosen 12, 11 apostles, and then they add one. It will pass on to one generation, and to another generation, and to another generation. And each generation will have to approve, select, and follow certain leaders. And he knows that as the time goes on, that all those leaders aren't all going to be that great. And so he holds up this standard for what it looks like to lead in the church at any level, not just as a pastor, but as anyone who would lead, anyone who would seek to be followed. This standard applies. He says, be careful. Be careful because there will be people who come along who are wolves in sheep's clothing. And you've heard that. That's one of our, uh, that's one of our sayings. It's one of our colloquialisms. We know that standard, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Uh, and you know the danger of that. If a, if a wolf gets in among the sheep, bad things happen. Not good for the sheep. So be careful, Jesus says, to pay attention to who you follow. Uh, because they can do great harm and great damage if you follow the wrong people. But he just doesn't make that statement. He also goes on to say, here's how you tell, right? How do you know who to follow? Huge question in our world today. How do you know who to trust? We live in a, a great age in so many ways where we have access to all the information in the world. For instance, if you want to know about what's going on with the United Methodist Church, just type in United Methodist Church split. And you'll only see about, oh, a million entries. And you'll start wading through that stuff. And you'll, you can read this opinion and that opinion. And then very quickly, the question is going to be, who do I trust? Because these things are saying different things. Same thing goes with any information you look up. You can find any number of opinions about any number of things. It's just how we live. We get millions of search results. How do you know what to trust? can be very, very difficult. I struggle with this. Even when I'm doing research for uh, sermons and Bible studies, sometimes I'll enter into a search engine, a question about biblical text, and I'm like, wow, who do I trust in this result? Well, Jesus talks about primarily people and who to trust. He says, pay close attention to what they do. And we know this. You, anybody can say anything they want to. But pay attention to what they do. Pay attention to who they are. This reinforces a larger theme that is embedded deeply in the Sermon on the Mount. Is that the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is, keeps on hitting at character development. And it's not easy. It is not easy. Love your enemies. I, I tell you, don't forget about committing adultery. Don't even lust in your heart. Uh, yeah, don't, don't, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, yeah, forget about murdering somebody. That's way off the table. What I tell you is don't even get angry. Wow. I pray for those who persecute you. In other words, love those who don't love you. That's not easy to do. The only way we can do that is by having a transformed character. A transformed being that begins to take on the very aspects of Christ's own personality. That's how that happens. And so when Jesus is saying, who do we follow? Who do we, who do we trust? He's like, look to what they produce. Look to their lives. Look beyond what they say. Um, 
several years ago, I was visiting a um, hospital down in Charlotte, Presbyterian, Maine. I guess it's Atrium, Maine. I don't know. They change the name every two weeks. But there are, there's some clergy parking there, which is nice, right? I'm used to pulling around and finding the clergy parking and seeing the usual suspects. You know, that 1982 Toyota Camry with 350,000 miles on it. One time I pulled into clergy parking and someone had driven the church van to the hospital. I admired their commitment. Uh, this particular day I, I pull around and right there in clergy parking is a brand new Ferrari. And it was a sweet car. And I thought, wonder whose church that is. Um... One of the things when I first met Marcy, part of the story of her family, uh, her grandmother had passed away, but there was a lot, uh, and it hadn't been too long ago before I met her. Her grandmother, some of the tension in her family was that her grandmother, every time she would get a, a social security check, she would send a, a big part of it to Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. Remember Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, the PTL club? If you don't, Google that. You'll find about a million entries on it. In 1986, Jim Baker, who's running this ministry out of Charlotte, his salary was $1.6 million, 1986. He would just swing by uh, the Mercedes place in Charlotte and buy cars for himself and Tammy Vay and some of the leaders on his staff. Because he said, the Lord says that he wants his people to travel first class. And if you know anything else about the rest of it, you know that that all came tumbling down. All came tumbling down amid all kinds of scandal and abuse and misbehavior. But millions literally followed on air. Hundreds of thousands showed up in person. He gets back to paying attention to who people are. And you should pay attention to who I am. Absolutely. You should pay attention to who Pastor Ben is. And you should really keep an eye on that Washco guy. <laughs> you should also keep an eye on each other. I'm not talking about in an invasive way, but in a way that helps hold each other accountable. If you see something in someone's life that doesn't align with the gospel of Jesus Christ and the teachings of Jesus, it's part of our community to say, hey, let's talk about that in a kind and loving way, but let's talk about that. You should look at people's behavior. Jesus says, it's, it, pay attention to what the fruit they produce. If you don't see the fruit in their life, then be careful. You should send up a big red flag. And the question then comes, what kind of fruit are we to look for? We know what misbehavior looks like. So what is the fruit that is scriptural, that is biblical, that needs to be the example and the standard by which leaders should be held to account? Well, look no further than this guy named Paul who gives us what the fruit of the Spirit is. That fruit of the Spirit, by the way, is Jesus' Spirit. It's kin, akin to who Jesus is. It's part and parcel of Jesus' personality and the characteristics that Jesus desires for us to have. Paul says in Galatians 5.22, he says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, uh, or generosity, right? Let me get, let me get that, say these again. We need to hear them. I'm, in case you can't tell, I'm, I'm having a hard time seeing this right now. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. That, that's what you should see in me. That's what you should see in Pastor Ben. That's what you should see in Pastor David. That's what you should see in Miss Jennifer. That's what you should see in Miss Carol Brown. I know, she, I know you got a, Carol's a little iffy. 
It's what you should see in all your church staff as we seek to live out a life of faithfulness. And if you don't see it, you need to let us know. And that's what we should see in each other. Because that is what a transformed life looks like. There's so much anger in our world. There's so much bitterness and contempt and blame and outright hatred. You don't get mass shootings every other day unless there's a lot of that stuff in the air. Which means our world is devoid of the spirit of Christ in so many places. It's incumbent upon us to take the spirit of Christ wherever we go. To help spread some good and some hope. Not give ourselves over to despair. And no matter what comes with what this church's decision is, we have to move forward with these understandings of how we treat each other. And I have to say, I'm very proud of this congregation. There have been congregations who have been mean to each other, who have slandered each other, who have yelled at each other, who have cussed each other. Our, our DS has been in many of these meetings and some of the things he's been called, I, I've learned a whole new vocabulary. There's no place for that. There just isn't. The fruit of the Spirit, pay attention to who you follow. Pay attention to their lives and hold them to that higher standard because, well, that's what Jesus says. Uh, believe me, I, I'd rather you not pay any attention to me at all. But this is what Jesus says. This next section of the Sermon on the Mount is, is, is the one that really pushes me and gives me trouble because it's about self-deception. Have you ever deceived yourself? I, yeah, you probably have. Have you ever talked yourself into doing something even when you knew it wasn't right? Have you ever justified your behavior? Come on. All of us do at one point or another. This pushes those to an extreme because Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me, you evildoers. The word prophesy in scripture very rarely means to tell the future. What it mostly means is to speak the word of God to the people of God, which means to preach. And so Jesus is saying, someone will show up and say, didn't I preach in your name? Didn't I do things in your name? Didn't I carry out ministries in your name? Didn't I accomplish things in your name? Uh, and that scares me. Uh, it, didn't I do that for you, Jesus? And Jesus will say, huh, I, I never knew you. Which gets us back to the heart of our faith. As the heart of our faith is about a relationship with Jesus. It's not always about the right answers. We like our right answers. We like to be able to pass the quiz after vacation Bible school's over. But do we know who Jesus is? Are we intimately and actively engaged with who he is in this world? Or do we just kind of go through the motions, get carried along by the stream? Uh, it's fascinating in America, you know, there'll be a lot of people pro profess Christianity, but plenty of room in churches last I saw. Actively being engaged. It, it, it looks something like this, and this is a, an illustration that I'm borrowing from a podcast that Pastor Ben shared with me. It has to do with being attentive to where you're going. Are you attentive to where you're going, or are you just getting carried along? How many of y'all have ever driven on I-277 in Charlotte? You know that road? 
great road, right? People merging from the left, people merging from the right, people exiting to the right, people exiting to the left. So if you are going to Atrium Presbyterian Hospital to park your Ferrari in the clergy parking lot, and you're coming from Denver, North Carolina, you will have to take, most likely, I-277. Exit 2A. So exit 2A is interesting because it's almost at the end of 277. It is right after the exit for Independence Boulevard shoots off to the left. You go around the curve, and right when you come around this, this curve, there's an on-ramp that has two merge lanes. Not one, but two. And then as soon as that on-ramp comes in and joins 277, the exit for 2A is about on the other side of the playground. So you've got 100, 150, maybe 200 yards to make that merge across two lanes of traffic after coming around a steep curve. You have to work at that. You have to be intentional with that. You have to come around that corner looking at your mirrors. You have to come around that corner at the right speed. And you got to go for it. Or you're going to be sucked back around 277 and you'll be, on, you'll be either heading to Columbia or back to Statesville. But the Christian walk asks us to be intentional. To pay attention to be engaged, to be in relationship. We can get, we can be carried along by our traditions, by our church attendance occasionally. But is that really what Jesus desires for us? See, Jesus desires to give us a really good life. And the only way to have that really good life and to develop the kind of character that produced those fruit is to be actively engaged in the person of Jesus in our lives. To follow him. And when we're following someone, we have to pay attention. We have to do it with intentionality. So 23 years ago, Marcy and I were married. That relationship began... Um, with a conversation. Her mom worked with a person in my church named Angie. Angie and Marcy's mother got to conspiring. And next thing I know, I had Marcy's phone number. And Marcy's mom had taken pictures off our desk. Remember, this is before the days of cell phones. And Xerox them on the, on the Kannapolis City School computer or whatever on the printer. And so Angie hands me a, pic, a Xerox picture, some pictures of this girl, young lady who's been Xeroxed off of photos with a name and number and said, you need to call this person. Um, my future wife had no idea her mom had done that. And she was absolutely horrified when she found out. But it began with a conversation. And then it began, then it moved to an invitation to have a meal. How many relationships go that way? Conversation, invitation, relationship. We're going to have a conversation with Jesus called the liturgy, a prayer before we come to this table. You're going to be invited to this table. And I pray that it deepens your relationship with the one you're invited to break bread with. As we come to the table of the Lord, let us acknowledge that we don't always pay attention. That there are times when we deceive ourselves. There are times when we don't bear the fruit of the Spirit. And so let us go to God with our prayers asking for forgiveness after we confess. Will you join me? Lord, you continuously reach out to us in your love, your grace, and your care. You open up to us avenues of grace. You open up to us avenues of love. And many times we simply say, no, thank you. I'd rather go this way or that way. We ask that you would forgive us 
when we are not attentive, when we don't follow, when we make mistakes. That's all of us here. And so we each take a few moments to ask forgiveness for the things that are specific to our own lives. So I invite you to lift your heads up. Here are these words that come from Paul in the book of Romans, but also from the words of the church. Christ died for you and for me while we were yet sinners, therefore proving God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. We remember that on the night that Jesus gave himself up for us, he took the bread, he broke the bread, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, <laughs> eat, this is my body broken for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup for us. This will serve as our cup. He took the cup, he blessed the cup, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. It's another way of saying this is my life. Poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. That which makes a way to be in relationship with God the Father. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so we ask, Almighty God, that you would pour out your blessings on all of us gathered here. That we pour out your blessings upon these symbols, these gifts of bread and cup. That you would make them be for us the body and blood, the very presence of Jesus in this place. We pray that you would pour out your spirit on all of us. Make us one with you, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until you return in your final glory. We pray this in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'd like to invite those who will be serving to please come forward. We do have gluten-free elements, and, they, and um, I will be serving those. And I think we need one more server to come on up, David or Ben, to serve with joy. Um, you're all invited. You don't have to be a member of this church. You don't have to be a member of any denomination. You simply have to come seeking to be at peace with God and peace with one another. Come and seek the Lord. You will receive a piece of the bread. You will receive the cup. There are receptacles on each side for the cup after you are through. If you'd like to spend some time in prayer, there's an altar rail here. If you'd like to return to your seat and pray there, that's perfectly fine too. If you have need of gluten-free elements, please come see me. I will have those. All is ready. All is prepared. Uh, we're going to flank out a little bit and we'll start from the outsides and work our way in and so if our servers will come and take the elements we will serve communion at this time i 
desperate for you And I I'm lost without you And I Please stand. Join me for this prayer after communion, followed by us all together saying the Lord's Prayer. Lord, we give you thanks for this holy mystery whereby you give yourself to us all over again. We need you to constantly come into our lives. Hold us close. Call us to account. Correct us and set us on that good and right pathway. I pray that we will be intentional followers of yours. For yours is the way that leads to life. Yours is the way that avoids destruction. Lord, grant us that wisdom and that grace, we pray. As together we pray the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, and the the kingdom. Have a great week, and look forward to seeing you back here next week.